Today is part number eight of a nine-part series that we've been on called The Prescription. And what we've come to know and believe over the first eight segments or last eight segments is that God still heals. Say it with me. God still heals. I'm talking everybody shout it. God still heals. That's what I'm talking about. And healing is not something that has ceased with the canonization of Scripture. Healing is not something that has stopped with the death of the last apostle of the Lamb. Actually, it is something that Jesus is still doing today. Hebrews 13, 8 says that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, forevermore. And so if Jesus healed in the Bible times, he still wants to heal in our time. If God did miracles in the Bible, he still wants to do miracles today. And it's important for us to realize that it is the will of God to heal. But what we've come to know is that the will of God is not automatic. The will of God has to be fought for by us. And it has to be sought after by us. Would somebody say amen? So I want to start by kind of going over some of the goals that we began eight weeks ago. And it wasn't a pure eight weeks because we had a stop for Mother's Day and then we did Celebration Sunday. So, you know, it was more than eight weeks ago, but eight sessions ago. We had three goals. Number one. Our first goal of this series was to build your faith in the promises of God for healing. How many of you all have felt like your faith has increased? Let me see about show of hands. Anybody? Okay, some of y'all not sure yet, and it's okay. And I realize that that's a real thing because of the things that you've experienced, the people that might have passed away in your life, or maybe you've prayed before and you didn't get what you want. Maybe it's harder for you to believe that what God's Word says is true. And I get that, that that is a reality of our humanity. But at the same time, you're going to have to feed yourself on the Word of God until you believe again. For there's nothing too hard for the Lord. And so we have all of this, these series that's going to be on YouTube and also the Alive Church app because we believe faith comes by hearing. Go home. When this series is over, keep putting this Word in your heart. Number two, our second goal was this, to equip you to pray for the sick and see them recover. Right Now, next week is our grand finale week, part number nine. And this is like the can't miss one. Matter of fact, I would be bold enough to ask you to make sure that you're here and bring like two or three people with you that ain't never been to church before. Next week is going to be an activation service. And so for the first eight segments, we've been talking about healing the sick and healing the sick and so forth and so on. But now we're talking about you going out and healing the sick. See, many people come to church to be healed, but now it's time for us to go away from the church and be the healers. Next week is going to be an activation service, and I don't know if we're going to have a prayer line or a tunnel, but we're going to lay hands on anybody who wants us to pray for you, and we're going to pray that the gift of healing be activated in you, that you will go out of this place with the boldness that when sickness show up, you're going to be the representative of the kingdom of God to see it flee. Next week, we're going to end with a bang. But our third goal was this, to see healings in our church move from occasional to normative. You know, we talked about how if you were to study healing evangelists, or, or, you know, around the world and back in the day, 3% of the crowd would get healed, and we're trying to see it go from occasional to normative. But I would like to ask this question. How many of you all have been healed since you've been a part of a live church? I mean, a sickness, disease, a pain in your body, emotional. Let me see by a show of hands. You've been healed. Could you stand real quickly? Could you just stand up real quick? Now, I want everybody to look around very quickly. Come on. Everybody look. Everybody look around. Okay. All right. Stay, stay standing for a moment. This is your sign. Because some people are here today and they say, well, God, if you're real, show me a sign. This is it. That's all we got. Just like you can't see the wind, but you see the effects of the wind. You can't see God, but we see the effects of God in all of these people. These are not paid actors. These are people that somehow God has done something in their life and they were this way, but now they're another way. Okay. And what we believe is that if he's done it before, he'll do it again. Thank you, guys. You all can be seated. God, God bless you. Now, I would say this to all of you people standing. Did you send your testimony in? Because I don't think I've received that many testimonies. So please, before you leave church today, grab out the connection card and where it says testimony, put yours right there, please, and turn it in so we can share with people what God's doing because some people believe that God's dead, but God ain't dead or done. He is still, he's still alive and he's still moving. I hear somebody questioning. It's like, but, but why didn't God do this? I'm not sure, but we still trust them. It's always going to be palms up, all right? So anyway, here's the word of the Lord for today. It has begun. 
So what we saw with people stand, standing is not the ending. Like, it's not like healing ends when this message is over next week. It's actually just begun in us. And my hope is that now you'll have something that shot up in your bones for a life pursuit of the miracle working power of God. This is not the end. It's the beginning. Say this with me. Open heaven is here and open heaven is now. Now let's go to Matthew 8 today. It's going to be good. I'm ready to go. Let's go. Matthew 8, verse number 5. Say amen when you're there. Matthew 8, verse number 5. We're going to look at the centurion soldier today. And he says, now when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant's lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. By the way, this man is acting as an intercessor for his servant. And you can act as an intercessor for your family and friends that don't believe in God. You can go to God on their behalf. And he says, Lord, my servant, he's lying at home paralyzed. He has a disability, y'all. I need you to put yourself in this situation. He's in pain. He's tormented. And watch verse 7. And Jesus said, I will come and heal him because it's always the will of Jesus to come and heal but the will of God has to be fought for and sought for. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you even come under my roof or into my house, but only speak a word. I like to say it this way, but speak the word only, and my servant will be what? Now, if you read the post text to the story, by the time you get over to verse 13, the Bible says that the paralyzed man was healed. And the Bible says that he was healed in the same hour that Jesus spoke the word. So there's a few things that we want to extrapolate out of this text. And you can take notes if you want to. Here's a few things. Number one, this text shows us the importance of humility. Now, most of the things that you're wanting God to do in you, for you, and through you come on the heels of humility. There's not going to be great signs and wonders to a person that is proud. And sometimes we're too proud to get healed. Sometimes we need to come down the front and let somebody pray for me. That's a sign of humility. Sometimes we need to go to God and say, God, I can't do this without you. It's a sign of humility. He says, Jesus, I'm not even worthy that you come into my house, but speak the word, humility. Number two, write this down. We see the importance of being under authority. And so for years I've said this, and I need you to hear this today. If you want to be in authority, you first must be under authority. And if you're not under authority, you won't be in the real kind of biblical authority. And there is a generation of people that have no spiritual authority because they rebel against the authorities that God has set up. We live in a council culture, and it is counseling the anointing on people's lives because to be in authority, you first must be under authority. So it's time out for the Lone Ranger Christians. And the people say, I don't believe in organized religion. I'm like, who disorganize it? Satan is the one that would disorganize it because he understands one to chase a thousand, but two of us together can put 10,000 to flight. He understands that in the house of God, you have elders and you have pastors to do what? Equip you to do the work of the ministry. We have spiritual fathers and mothers. And so if you want to do Christianity by yourself, you can't be in the will of God. And so it's important for us to know that to be in authority, we have to be under authority. That's why I have a pastor. That's why I have um, overseers in my life. But we also learn out of this, number three, that there is power in our words. The power that is in our words. So today's message, are y'all ready? Part number eight is called speak the word. Go ahead and tell your neighbor, you got to speak the word. You got to. And in, in subtitle, I would say words that heal because there's words that hurt and words that heal. But my hope for you today is that after today, you're going to go home. And you're going to speak the word. Sickness shows up. You can talk about what the doctor said or you can speak the word. You can talk about how you feel or you can speak the word. You can talk about what's happening in your marriage or you can speak the word. And whenever you speak the word, you release what heaven has for you in your direction. You just got to go home and speak the word. And I've learned over the years that words can hurt, but words can also heal. And we have this, these popular sayings in our culture, and y'all probably have heard this one before. Sticks and stones may, what? Break our bones, but what? Words will never hurt us. And what I found out is that that's kind of true, but then it kind of ain't at the same time. 
We say that to our kids because they got in a fight on the playground with little Johnny, and little Johnny was bullying them. Well, it wasn't a fight. He was just using words. And he said this and said that and was talking about his mama and stuff like that. And your kid come home all distressed. And you said to them, sticks and stones may hurt your bones, meaning that as long as he ain't touch you, you're going to be okay. That's, that's like true, you know, because I think it's true that we need to raise up our kids not to care about what other people always say. Come on, somebody. Some of you all today are tripping on words that were spoken over you 15 years ago. And sometimes you just got to say, listen, with success comes haters. With success comes naysayers. If you're the first in your family to do anything different than what your family did, there's going to be somebody talking about you. And what I realize is that people are going to talk about you whether you're doing good, bad, or absolutely nothing at all. So since you're going to talk about me when I'm doing bad and talk about me when I'm doing good, you might as well talk about me when I'm living the abundant life in the perfect will of God because people always going to talk about me. I'm used to it now. I'm like, bring it on. That's right. So I get it that it's true that sometimes we got to just, I don't care what you think. I don't care on social media. I don't care my trolls. I don't care what you think. You ain't even got a job. Don't be talking to me on my social media. You're like, I don't care what you think. Like, you know what I care? What they, I think about what God thinks. I care about what this woman right here thinks. I care about my executive pastor, my pastor, my overseer. And then I'm starting to slow it way down after that about who I really care about what will think about me. That was just for me. I'm sorry. That, that had no redemptive value at all, but I don't, I don't care. But we say sticks and stones may hurt, break our bones, but words will never hurt us. But scientifically, we, it's been proven that words do hurt. Scientifically, it's been proven. So we found that this statement is scientifically inaccurate and biblically untrue, okay? Matter of fact, what science says, if you Google it, what do words do to your body, you'll, you'll realize that negative words release stress and anxiety-inducing hormones that can negatively affect your brain. Right now, I'm like binge-watching and binge-listening to Dr. Caroline Leaf, who is one of the top neuroscientists in the world. She's a Christian, too, and she talks about neuroplasticity and about um, how your brain can, can move and shape and function and grow good or bad, so forth and so on. She talks about um, neurocycling and mind management and things like that, because I, ju I just find science to be fascinating. Good science, that is. Bad science sucks. Good science is science that confirms the reality of God. Bad science is where people get so smart they think that God doesn't exist. You got to throw that in the trash. I take the meat, leave the bones. But good science shows us that words do release something in your body. They, they, they do matter. But when I want to know, like, my biblical worldview or when I want to know what I believe, I don't just go to science. Thank God for it. I go to God's Word. Now, I said that to help you all make the transition. Meaning that I'm not going to place my eternal life just on a report or some study that some secular person has done. When I want to know how I'm supposed to look at stuff, I'm going to the Word of God. Come on, somebody. Anybody with me? I'm going to the Word. Excuse me. And so Proverbs chapter number 18, verse 21, it says this. Are y'all with me? It says, death and life whoo, are in the power of the what? And those who love it will what? That's powerful. Now, you are eating the fruit of what you've been saying. If you have bad fruit, you should change what's in your tongue. If you have good fruit, you should keep on saying what you've been saying. But I love the extremes. Death and life. <laughs> he could have came in softer with it, you know what I'm saying? He says death and life are in the power of your tongue. So there's power in your tongue. And it's amazing to me that it's not just for taste buds. You know what I'm saying? It's not just for you tasting. What are you thinking about right now? What kind of food are you thinking about? Yeah, whatever. It's not just for that. You get the opportunity to speak life or to speak death. And we have to speak the word of God. Go with me over to Matthew chapter number 12. <clears throat> Matthew chapter number 12, it says, But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, he will give an account of it on the day of judgment. <laughs> now, let's leave that up for a moment, and everybody circle the word idle. Somebody shout idle, idle. So it says, not some idle words that you speak, but for every idle word that you speak, you're going to have to give an account of it, okay? Now, the word idle simply means non-operative words or words that don't have power, they don't have purpose, and they don't have meaning. 
It's kind of like when you say stuff like, well, I just can't get ends to meet. And I don't know what that is, but it's not operative. It has no power in it. I know it might make you feel good. I'm never going to get out of this jam. Okay, you sure not if that's the way you've been speaking about it. I just can't catch a break. Oh, Lord. I just don't trust people. I can't put up with people. Those things are not evil, but they are idle. It's not that I'm saying that those words are evil. You can say them if you want to, but are they doing you any good? And so what, what God's Word wants us to do is to not say what you see, but say what you want to see until you see what you've been saying. Some of you all are so accustomed to looking around at brokenness and say, it's so broke. But you should look at, around at brokenness and say, all things are working together for my good because I love God. And, oh, y'all not ready for this yet. I don't know. God's Word wants us to call things that be not as though they are until they are. So when you don't have anything to your name and you're broken emotionally and mentally, you should go before God. You should get up in the morning. I'm the head and not the tail. I'm blessed in the city and blessed in the field. Everything I touch prospers, and everywhere the foot of my heel treads upon, he gives it to me as my land. He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And since I diligently seek you, God, I expect the rewards of the Lord today. You load me daily with benefit. There is no good thing that you withhold from them that walk upright. And so I thank you for good things. Something good is going to happen for me today. That takes a lot of intentionality, but what you're doing is you're speaking life. Matthew chapter 12, so it says, Matthew chapter 12, bring that back up if you don't mind and just keep it up for me. Matthew chapter 12. Uh, but I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give an account of it in the day of what? It just got real. And so that's one of those words that most people nowadays they don't like to talk about, but it is a reality for 7 billion people and every person that comes in this planet that at the end of our lives, we will face judgment. And the Bible, let me give you a quick Bible education, gives us two different judgments that will happen. The first one is called the great white throne judgment. This is the judgment for unbelievers. So for the people who've rejected Jesus or not accepted Jesus, the Bible says that they will be called up from the grave or called out of hell. They will stand before Jesus. They will give an account. And then them plus hell will be thrown into the lake of fire, which is the second death for the rest of eternity. You don't want to be there. That's all I'm saying about that. You, that, 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 that ain't where you want to be. You, you, no, for real. That, I don't want nothing to do. With that whole lack of fire stuff and that whole second death stuff, okay? But for those of us who've accepted Jesus and we put our faith in the Lamb of God, we will also be judged, but we won't be at the great white throne judgment. We will be at what the Bible calls the judgment seat of Christ, also known as the Bema seat. And we all will stand before Jesus and we will not be judged to damnation but we will be judged to either receive eternal rewards or lose eternal rewards. Now, I don't know about you. I want my crown, the soul winner's crown. I want all the rewards. I want my mansion. I want all of that stuff. And I'm be driving by your house, be like, what happened? You ain't doing what you were supposed to do while we was in Orlando. But <laughs> don't, don't be upset. Be hating on my crown, you know, with the jewels and everything, you know. But this is what I need you to know, that every idle word is going to come up again. So it does matter what you say out of your mouth. For by your words you'll be justified, and by your words you'll be what? There's power in what you say. I love it over in Ephesians chapter number 4. Watch this one, Ephesians chapter 4. <laughs> it says, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what's helpful for the building up of others according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Don't you wish people on social media would read Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 29? Because it seems like we live in a day and time where people would rather tear you down than build you up. I'm talking about in the name of Jesus. I'm talking about people that got John 3, 16 in their profile. But if they don't like another preacher, if they don't like somebody else's doctrine, they will send them to hell quicker than ever. And my thing is like, are you praying with them? That's amazing to me. Because my Bible says that love covers a multitude of sins. And so what I want you to do is when you see haters, you just post Ephesians 4.29 in the comments and you back out of it. No, don't do that. I, I, you know why you can't do that? Because they love that stuff. 
that gives them fuel. Oh, yeah, because then they'll come back. No, judgment starts in the house of God. And I'm just trying to expose the evil works of darkness. Really? But the Bible says, cover sins, don't expose sins. What's the problem? They have an Old Testament legalistic spirit that they're trying to apply in a grace-filled season. And so they're extrapolating scriptures in the Old Testament about judgment, not wanting anybody else to judgment, and they're casting a large, a large net of judgment on everybody else who don't think like they think and believe like they believe. And so you cannot win that battle, just stay out of it. But I wish they would understand this. But only what is helpful for the building up of others according to their needs, that it may benefit them that listen. Praise God. And so this word unwholesome talk comes from a Greek word that means rotten or foul talk. I wonder how many of you all are still using, praise God, rotten or foul talk. Y'all look nervous on this side. I'll go over here. I'll go over here. The Bible says don't let any rotten or foul talk come out. Can I, can I keep it real with you today? Can I, can I make it plain? Somebody say make it plain, Pastor. By the Spirit of the Lord, I want to help somebody today retire your book of cussing. Uh, this service ain't clapping yet because I got all my cussings at the 1130 service. You know what I'm saying? I, by the Spirit of God, need to do surgery in your heart and in your mouth to hopefully help you put that book cussing on the altar. I call it a book because anytime you get in a jam, you go in your back pocket and you pull out an A word. You can kiss my A and you, you pull out an F word and you drop an F bomb. But then you talk about Jesus in one moment and you curse man in another moment. And my hope today is to remove the foul talk. My hope today is to remove the rotten talk. The, the, <laughs> the phrase actually comes from a, um, a word that means like rotten vegetables and rotten tomatoes. And that's what some of us have. We have a rotten mouth. And some of y'all, y'all can cuss. I mean, you know how to put your words together? I mean, you go home and plan that thing. I'm going to say yes. I'm going to say yes. I know you might not believe this, but this is the God honest truth. I haven't used any profanity in over 20 years. 20 years. You hear me in the back? 20 years. And I know that some people are like, oh, I don't know if I believe that. Because that statement is so challenging that for some people, they feel like um, they feel now condemned. They feel like, well, you ain't know what I said when I came up in here today or what I'm thinking right now, you know. But I don't say that to be holier than thou. I say that to let you know there is a better way. And you have more control over your tongue than what you even know. And every idle word that man shall speak thereof. I, I hear the, pack, the, the cussing preachers out there. Nowadays, you turn on social media, I hear people that are men or women of the cloth, so to say. I don't even know what that means. What cloth? I don't know. <laughs> Clergy. And they're using profanity. I mean, I'll be hanging out with them. And I just be, and they like to do it on the down low. You know, you know, you know, whatever they say. <laughs> and they think it's funny, but to me, not to judge, but just to say, oh, you're still here. You still talking like we used to talk back in middle school, but you a man of God. And you don't understand it. Life and death is supposed to be coming out of the power. Of, life and death is in the power of your tongue. You're supposed to be prophesying over dry bones and moving mountains with what comes out of your mouth. And you still hear. You're still here. And my hope for the church is that we just get a revelation. I, and this is not like condemnation. This is just revelation. Come on, somebody. That what you say does matter. Now, how many of you all, if you were honest, say, yeah, pastor, you're talking to me. I, my, 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 my mouth needs some help. Thank you for your honesty. God bless you. I told you, y'all was in the 1130 service. I know you. <laughs> How many of y'all will take the 30-day no cussing contest with me? 30 days. All right. Now, <laughs> now you're going to need help. So I need you to go ahead and ask your neighbor, Simmonside, will you help me with this? Because you're going to need some accountability. And if, you, if you're sitting by another cusser, they can't help you. You got to find somebody who's mastered this, this moment. All right. You, you got to get some help. You need somebody, and you just tell them, listen, if you hear me say any of these words, you have permission to slap me one time. <laughs> just Will Smith me, right? Just run up on me. Uh, just, was that too much? I'm sorry. But uh, just whatever you need to do, just one good time. Because some of us, we need a conscious interrupt. 
because that is our natural programming. We get in traffic, we flip the finger, we, listen, I've even heard motivational speakers that are very popular say that I use profanity on purpose because it does something in the crowd. And to me, it's like if your vocabulary is not extended enough as a motivational speaker to inspire and motivate people without being vulgar and foul, you need to go back to elementary school. I have a microphone strapped to my mouth every single week for the last 15 years, and I motivate and inspire people around the world but haven't cussed in 20 years. You got to come to the Ken Clayton School of Language. <laughs> come on, are you kidding me? And so, listen. But I, I'm like you. Sometimes I won't cuss folk out, for real. Because some, yo, how many of y'all know some people need to be cussed out? It's just like, oh my God. Mm. 20 years of discipline. 20 years. Even if I, if I, if I uh, stub my toe in the middle of the night. You know how some of y'all stub your toe? And you know what you say. You know what I do when I stub my toe? What comes out? Jesus. Oh, oh, glory, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Hey, because what's in you is going to come out of you when you're hurting. What's in you is going to come out of you when you're pressured. What's in you is going to come out of you. So my question is what's in you? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so <laughs> that's why I can't listen to any music and stuff. Because certain stuff is going in there. And that's why it's coming out. Because of what you're putting in. We'll come back there later. Let's move on. Let's go over to James chapter 3. I'm having a good time. Whether you're not having one or not, I don't care. <laughs> James chapter 3. Y'all there? Verse number 3 says, When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. So you can turn your life by turning your mouth. Or take ships as an example. Although they're so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small, go ahead, rudder, wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part, somebody say a small part of the body, but it makes a great boast. Consider what a great force that sets on fire by a small spark. Go ahead. The tongue is also a fire, and it's a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body. Your tongue can corrupt your whole body. And it sets the whole course of one's life on fire and is itself set on fire by hell. Because of what's in my mouth? All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. Let's read verse 8 together. Ready, read. But no human being... I said it was verse 8. Ready, read. But no... So you need the help of the Lord on this one. Because human beings, we can't tame this. We need God's help on this one. It is a restless evil, and it's full of deadly poison. Go ahead. With the tongue, we praise the Lord our Father, and with the tongue, we curse human beings who've been made in the likeness of God. You know how you do when you're in traffic. You leave church praising the Lord, cussing people out down I-4. <laughs> and out of the same mouth come praises and cursings. And I love this part. My brothers and sisters, this ought not be. And so, you know, people come to me after church. Hey, Pastor Ken, man, the message was so good. You, you know how y'all do, right? Y'all don't do that? Start doing that. Pastor Ken, <laughs> man, thank you for the word of God. It's changing my life. It's so good. And the same people that will praise me will go home and cuss out their spouse. The Bible says it this way in one translation, that out of the same cistern or the same well come bitter waters and sweet. What the Bible says is, brothers and sisters, this ought not be. You're going to have to make a, a commitment, and this message really isn't about profanity. It's about idle words. It's about wasteless things. It's about saying things with no purpose. It's about not having the revelation that there's power in your mouth, power in your tongue. Are you all with me today? Okay. And so... <clears throat> When it comes to words, here's a few things I've learned over the years. With the new birth, there should also come new language. One of the first messages that I ever heard was a message about the language of a new man. That's what it was called, I think. And the premise is this, that when you get born again, 
You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. But with that new birth should also be new words. Here's some things that I've learned over the last 20 years. That it's important for us to guard the gates. Everybody say, I got to guard the gates. The scripture in Proverbs says, guard your heart above all else, for out of it flows what? The issues of life. How many of y'all have any issues in your life? Much of it is flowing out of the core of who you are or your heart. And how do you guard your heart? You guard it by guarding your ears and your eyes. Your ear gate and your eye gate leads to the heart gate. And so for me, you can do whatever you want to do. I don't watch a lot of, I don't watch rated R movies. There's a lot of stuff that I don't listen to. It's not because I don't think it's cool and I don't like the beat. It just, I just know that I have to guard what goes in my ears because what goes in my ears affects what's in my heart and what's in my heart is coming into my life. You be the steward. <laughs> it's amazing. If I went through some of your playlists, you would have so much sexually perverse music. You would have so much bang them, shoot them up, profanity, crazy stuff. And you would tell me, oh, I just like it for the beat. The devil is a liar. There are words attached to those beats. And those words are sowing a seed in the ground of your heart that will produce a harvest in your life. And you have one heart and one soul. You better steward it well. Somebody shout, I got to guard the gates. What I've learned over the last 20 years of ministry is that words can hurt, but words can also heal. And listen, there is a divine connection between what you say and releasing the healing power of God. So when we're talking about healing, let's bring it into this context. There is a divine connection between your words and people getting healed. Proverbs 12, 18 says it this way. It says, there are those who speak rashly like the piercing of a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Tongue, healing. There's a divine connection between the words you speak and the healings that manifest itself. <laughs> Proverbs 16, 24, watch this one. Pleasant words are like a honeycomb. Sweetness to the soul and health to the what? Bones. Words bring health. You know somebody who's dealing with osteoporosis, a problem in their bones, bone cancer. They need to hear the word, pleasant words, the word of God all the time. They need to be speaking the word. There's a divine connection between words and the healing power of God being released. Psalms 107 and 20, it says, he sent his word and healed them, and he delivered them from their destruction. All right? There's a divine connection. So this reminds me of Matthew chapter 8. The centurion soldier tells Jesus, listen, I'm not worthy for you to come into my house, but why don't you say the word only, and my servant will be healed. And the servant was healed because he spoke words that released the healing power of God. Are y'all with me today? You get this. And so anyway, I'm, I'm excited about next Sunday. Um, I feel like my voice has changed. Hello. Um, next Sunday is going to be an activation service. I'm excited about it. Um, I want to leave you in part eight with a few things to do. Y'all ready for it? Yes. Now, how many of y'all want to be blessed? Okay. A couple people didn't lift their hands. Maybe y'all might be a little tired. How many of y'all want to be blessed? You want to be blessed. The Bible says... Don't be a forgetful hearer, deceiving yourself, but it's the doers of the word that shall be blessed. So I want to give you a few things that I encourage you to do. Now, I realize that there's all kinds of podcasters, all kinds of messages, and sometimes we can be master hearers. Man, that was a good, that was a good message. What you take from it? I don't know, but it was good. What you going to do with it? I don't know, but it was good. What do you talk about? I asked my kids, what was the message about? I don't know. But it was good. But I think it's important that when we sit in these moments that you don't hear the 10,000 words that I'm saying, but the one word that's for you from God. What is it that God is speaking to you to do today? Because it's only the doers of the word that shall be blessed. So here's a few things that I want to encourage you to do today. Are y'all ready? Say, I'm ready. Number one, don't own your sickness, quotation marks. Don't own your sickness. 
I hear people talking about my glaucoma and my diabetes and my high blood pressure and my cancer. Listen, it ain't yours. It came from hell. Send it back to hell where it came from. Return to sender. You might be challenged, but don't you ever own it. My grandma Lulu used to say, who is my grandma on my father's side, she says, don't claim your cold. And I didn't know she had divine revelation. When Tabitha went through cancer or her cancer battle, she never said, I had cancer. Now, y'all can go back, listen to the tape. Even though we don't have tape, we actually, it's all digital stuff nowadays. It's fancy. But you can go back and listen to everything that we've ever said. We never said that she had cancer because that's too close to cancer having her. We said that she was diagnosed with cancer. We said that she was challenged with cancer. We said that she was fighting against cancer, but we never said she had it. Some of you all have claimed your sickness, and now it's yours. And I need you to send it back to hell where it came from. I'm not saying don't communicate to people what you're going through. I'm just saying frame it with faith. You got to be intentional with the words that are coming out of your mouth and say things that heaven can co-sign. You will never, what I just say, never hear me say I'm sick. And I'm not mad for those of you all who do. I have employees calling off. They say, hey, I'm sick. It's okay. I'm not mad at you. People in the lobby, hey, pastor, I'm so sick. You just won't hear your boy say that. Because Isaiah 53 says that I've been healed by his stripes. So either I'm sick or I'm healed, but I can't do both. So what do I say? My stomach is hurting. I don't feel my best today because feelings ain't got nothing to do with my revelation of my healing. I'm being challenged today because every challenge I already win. I am framing everything because I have a revelation that there's power in here. <laughs> Are y'all with me today? People say, how you doing? I, I'm not feeling my best today. That I'm framing that because I know that I'm going to feel my best later on. But, so I, wanna, I don't want to lie to you. I want to communicate to you what's going on with me, but I'm too healed to be sick. So I always talk about I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus. Number two, I'm going to ask you to do this today. Use your weapon wisely because words are weapons. They are weapons of mass destruction or mass construction. They're always building up or they're always tearing down. I was talking to my counselor a little while back, and, you know, we go into everything. He's retired now, so I got to find me another guy, but my guy was good. And he said, um, we was talking, I said, man, I want to be a better parent. Anybody here want to be a better parent? I want to be a better parent. You ever felt like you're losing or like you're not a good parent or like, man, am I doing enough for my kids? Am I doing this, that, and the other? And this is what he said. He says, Ken, it doesn't matter how many games you show up for. It doesn't have much, matter how much money you have or how many things you buy, buy them. The greatest asset that you have with your kids is your voice. Lead them with your voice meaning that you have the opportunity to call them who they're going to become, and they become it. And he says, not only do you have that authority as a parent, you have it as a lead pastor. You go home and lead your church with your voice. Might not be the best preacher, might not be the best theologian, but I'm going to use the one asset that I have to paint clear picture, vision of what God wants to do in each and every one of our lives. And as a parent, sometimes your kids act bad, and there's a temptation to say, you are bad. But just because they're acting bad doesn't make them bad. And you have to frame your words with faith. And so now my kids can do something, I'll be like, that was wrong what you did. And you're not supposed to do that because you're a man of God. You're a woman of God. You're a person of integrity. You're a person of character. What am I doing? I'm speaking to their destiny. I'm not talking to the problem. I'm talking to the promise. And I got kids, y'all. My youngin, I hope he's not in here right now. Let me tell you what he did. My youngest son, he's witty. This guy, you know, you know you're not supposed to have a Google account until you're 18. He got a device. We were out of town. Created a Google account created an Amazon account, ordered the biggest bag of Reese cups, had it delivered from Amazon while we were out of town. Leslie was babysitting at home. She finds it in, where was it at, Leslie? By his bed. It was like, by his bed. We're out of town. She sends us a picture like, 
I don't know where he got this. We're like, Kenny, where did you get the bag, the bucket of Reese cups? Found out the man made an Amazon account. So I can go and say, you're bad, or I can frame it with faith, because that's actually his genius, but it's just not redeemed yet. See, the things that your kids, that you can't stand, is actually how God made them. It's the expression of them to the world that God, but it just needs to be saved and sanctified. Come on, somebody. And so I got one of my kids that's kind of quiet. That's her genius. She's a thinker. She's processing. She's a peacemaker. I got one of my kids that's, that's always telling everybody what to do. She's the leader. She's the president. She's the CEO. I got my guy who's innovative and creative enough to do stuff in the house like he hooked up a TV screen and hooked up all of our devices to Alexa. Now you can literally say, say something to him and I don't know what happens. His face pops up like you can like like he can control the whole house through Alexa. Now I can say, listen, would you stop doing that? We told you to stop doing those kind of things. Or I can say, you're not bad, you're creative, you have innovation, you are fearfully and wonderfully made, but don't do that no more. So he, he, he's grounded till tomorrow. He gets off being grounded, this, this crazy stuff. So y'all know me, I'm kind of city guy. I'm not, I'm not, even though I'm from West Virginia, which is hillbilly country. But I never, I never been hunting before. Now people in West Virginia do that stuff. That's why I left. <laughs> and I know some of y'all, y'all love to fish and hunt, and that's just not my thing. Okay. And and if I was honest, I never shot a gun before. So I was asked to go hunting in Louisiana in February, and there was a bunch of pastors. They wanted me to go. Man, well, you got to get around on these paths. You got to come. You got to come. I said, okay, I went. I think they got a picture here. And this is your boy. Now I'm. <laughs> Listen, I'm decked out though. I went to Bass Pro Shop, I got the best orange. I was the flyest guy there. I'm talking about I had the hat. I got or I had orange gloves that matched my hat. It was so wonderful. It was crazy. But I never shot a gun before, right? So we were, we're hunting quail. And so what you do is you go out with three people. Basically, you got a guy with the dogs, and you got another partner, and we're walking around, and that's why I got my gun up like this, because of safety. I got a weapon. And I'm a new, I'm a new, new person here, so I'm, I'm walking around like this. Everybody else shooting, I'm still walking around with the barrel up, with the safety on, because I want to make sure that when I got a loaded weapon, that I don't hurt nobody with the weapon that I've been given. And the guy, he would have his dogs, and he would say, okay, the dogs got him right here. Everybody stop right here. Okay, take your safety off. Everybody get ready. And the dogs would say, go get them. And they would be like quail would come up. They'd be flying, right? And then my instructor, the guy who was with us, he would bend down. He said, well, just shoot over my head. And I was thinking, I'm not going to shoot over your head. Like, that doesn't seem like it's safe. You want me to shoot? Like, I'm a brand new guy. I just put my first round in ammunition in the gun. I'm not going to shoot over your head. So everybody else is shooting. I'm still standing there because I realized that I have a loaded weapon. And their thing was like, yeah, as long as you shoot high, it's going to be okay. But if you shoot low, that's how people get hurt. And they were saying it like it was no big deal. And I said, well, has anybody ever been shot before? And they was like, well... Uh, and they said, Pastor Sean Nepstad, who's going to be with us in June, accidentally shot Dave Martin, who was another pastor, used to be in Orlando. But he didn't hurt him bad. Just some of the pellets hit his face, and we wiped off the blood and everything. And I'm like, what are you talking about? You got random rookies running around with loaded weapons. Like, no, this is, this is a weapon. And I want somebody to hear this today, because in your mouth you have a weapon. And when you know that your words are weapons, you don't just put them and use them any old kind of way. You got to begin to frame things in faith and be intentional for life and death is in the power of your tongue. And if you love it, you'll eat its fruit. But it does matter what you're saying. So words are weapons. You got to use them wisely. But number three, and I'll be done, is you got to speak the word. Come on, would you tell three people around you, you got to speak the word. You got got to speak the word. You need to go home and get you a confession. Matter of fact, for healing on the website, if you go through 21 days of prayer, um, 21 days, I don't know, we have some things on our website from what is the series, The Prescription, and you can download faith declarations or faith confessions. The word confession comes from a Greek word homologio. Homo meaning same. Logos, logos, the word of God where you have 
rhema or logos, so it means to say the same words God does. And sometimes you say what other people say more than say what God says about you. And I dare you to go home and start opening up your mouth and creating the world that you want. I'm not saying that you can go to your house and speak to the wall and move it over here. I ain't talking about no far out stuff like that. But what I'm saying is that your words influence every situation. And you have to begin to use your weapon with wisdom. Speak the word. Speak the word. Speak the word. I'm going to pray for you guys today, if you don't mind, with every head bowed and every eye closed. I want to give you an opportunity to speak the word to Jesus. Mm. Salvation is so simple. It is a belief and a confession. Notice this, that if you can't speak, well, then there's something different from you. You can sign or you can do different things. But the foundation of salvation is a belief and also a confession, meaning that you believe in Jesus and you say it with your mouth. Why? Because that's how faith is released. This is how important what you say is that in the foundation of you coming to Jesus, it has to do with what you say. And if you're here today and you say, Pastor, I have sinned. If you've ever sinned in your life, and we all have, that means that we're all in need of a Savior. You don't have to be perfect to be forgiven, but you do have to surrender. I believe there's quite a few people that are here today that you're good people, and maybe you've never been to church before, you've been away from church for a while, or maybe you've been in church for a long time, but you're not sure that your name would be found in the Lamb's Book of Life, and you want to make sure that you show up at the right judgment seat, praise God. I would love to pray with you. And so with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here today and you say, Pastor, pray for me, I want to be forgiven of my sins. I want to be at peace with God when I leave here. I want to surrender my life to his life, my will to God's will. If that's you, I'm going to ask you to lift the hand on the count of three. I'm going to pray with you. You can wave at me just a minute, and you can put it down, and then we're all going to pray together. I just want to know who I'm praying for today. This is your moment. If that's you and you say, Pastor, pray with me. I want to be right with God. I want to make Jesus the Lord of my life. On the count of three, please lift, lift up your hand in one, two, three. Lift it up bold and high right now. Thank you. I see your hand, 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 your hand. You can put your hands down. Is there anybody here that should have lifted your hand but you didn't? But you like, man, I really wish that I would have. Maybe you were thinking about something else or you just missed that moment. I want you to know that our God is a God of a second chance. And here's another chance for you. If you say, Pastor, include me in that prayer, you might be 95% sure you're saved, 99% sure, but you're not 100% certain today. Allow me to pray for you. If that's you, would you lift up your hand if you didn't already right now, all over the building. Say, include me in that prayer. Thank you. I see your hand. Anyone else? Nobody prays alone. Thank you. In the back, I see your hand. Let's pray this together. Pray this from your heart. This is not about your neighbor, not about who you rode here with, not about none of that. This is about you and Jesus. Come say this with me. Lord Jesus, come into my heart today. Forgive me of my sins. From this day forward, I need you. Thank you for dying on the cross so that I could live forever with you. Lord Jesus, forgive me, restore me, heal me, and save me today. Thank you for being my Lord and my Savior. I'm yours and you're mine. I am forgiven. I am loved. I'm accepted by you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.
Hey, thank you so much for tuning in to Alive Online today. I pray that message was a blessing to you. I pray that the Holy Spirit just takes something from it and He illuminates it to where your life will never be the same again. If that's the case, make sure you let us know how your life was impacted and changed because of the message on today. We would love for you to share this content. You know, we have a saying in Alive Church that one invite can change a life. We also believe that one share can change a life. I mean, get your share on. God will use your share as a lifeline to reach people around the world. All right, if you like what we're doing here, we would love for you to be a part of our online family. You can do that by hitting subscribe. We want you to be the first to grab hold of all new messages and all new content as they are released. You know, the Bible says that when we give, it'll be given back to us. Good measure pressed down, shaken together and running over. And one of the greatest ways that you can make a difference and change lives is by giving. And so if you would like to sow into the ministry of Alive Church, hit the button below. And I know that God will bless you and you'll also be a blessing to other people. We love you and we'll see you real soon. God bless you.